Welcome back to this week's episode of the MVP Real Estate Podcast. We have Alan Orbach here uh, from Southern Florida, uh, originally from Israel, moved to the state 17 years ago, uh, started as a volleyball career, found himself in real estate, um, a very cool niche market of real estate, which is uh, luxury short-term rentals, uh, primarily southeastern part of the U.S., uh, hubbed right now in Florida, but talks about in the show where they're moving into different markets. They're looking at Texas, a couple other places. Um, very fascinating uh, niche. I, I mean, it's super cool. And I talk about in the show where where my nerves are in my stressors of investing long distance to him, cool as a cucumber. Like it's another day in the office. So it's it's super cool to see where we're my fears are are at and where his are at and uh i mean both are doing well within real estate so it's super cool to to see different philosophies kind of come together here so um i'll let him tell the story uh so let's bring him on so thanks for being here alon uh thanks for giving us the time here on a friday of course thank you for having me and uh, excited about this conversation and the fact that it's friday <laughs> Yes, that is always a benefit. Um, I'm excited to learn a little bit more about the the vacation rental market in Florida. See, me and Dan are here in Wisconsin. Our temperatures are dropping. I think the past week we've been in maybe the 60s. We're falling to like below 50s at night. Oh, wow. And I'm That's imagining great. you're in a completely different climate at this point. So I don't know if you guys are aware there was a, a storm alert in the last couple of days schools were canceled and that's kind of like florida life like they cancel school and usually nothing happened we actually have properties in tampa area and tampa did get a lot of heavy rain and some floods so in tampa we do have right now at least one house that i know that got flooded that we're oh. taking care of it um i don't know yet all the properties but uh, the weather is great where I'm at, <laughs> but that, that's yeah. Florida. You can drive like four hours and it's a storm. Yeah. No, I heard about that whole thing. And it's me and Dan actually worked at a previous company and we had some reps in Florida. And I don't remember what mm. hurricane it was, what year it was. But yeah, all the reps had to stay inside and everybody was boarded up because it was going right through Florida. Four or five years ago, maybe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So four or five years ago, th there was uh, a storm that, you know, every time they talk about a storm, so you go to like grocery stores, all the water is, uh, you know, the flashlights, everybody buy everything they can get a hold of. Yeah. And then usually nothing happened. And then you're like a little bit, oh, man, I was like waiting for it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Every every time it happens, I'm saying like, oh, there's probably going to be a real estate opportunity now. <laughs> Quick question. Well, that's that. a good way to look at it. When you yeah. have when you have a property like that, like you said, in Tampa. Mm -hmm. Do you, I know some, some, uh, insure insurers will not cover houses there anymore. So do, do you have homeowners insurance that will cover flooding like that? So, so the quick answer is yes, okay. but it's actually a good question because the insurance in the last year and a half drastically increased to a point that it's insane. So if yeah. people buy cash, sometimes they don't insure the wind. You can still insure the flooding. Flood is uh, insurance is relatively cheap. Okay. Um, but it did change. Like it's harder to find companies, and it's harder to get insured. But I can tell you, it's a. It's in Florida. You have to like when you're in a flood zone. It's a lifesaver. I mean, it definitely a must to do, and we have it in every property. Wow, I would have thought flood insurance would be way more expensive down there, seeing as it's. Probably one of the bigger items that insurance companies deals with. Down so there. surprisingly, it's the wind. The wind in some of our properties can be twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year, just wind. Oh, and the flood can be like fifteen hundred. So you, you can imagine how like cheaper wow. it is. Yeah, so I, think, I think the thing that I think we lose sight of is most of the properties up here have basements. So and most of them are refinished. A lot of them is where you where you house like your washer dryer, you know, basically an extra rec room or living room in the basement. Right. So 
when we think of like costs associated with flooding, we primarily think it's going to be within our basement and it's going to be twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars if on the low end. But most of the properties in Florida don't have basements, correct? You know, in all my history of real estate, I've seen one house with a basement, and to me, it was like I can't believe it. <laughs> like, I, it was such an odd thing yeah. to see. Uh, and so it happened once. Um, it was actually a really nice house, but yeah, you don't have basements here. Uh, okay. But you know, something interesting. I literally just talked about it yesterday because of the the storm. There was a house in Tampa that we closed the contract on that was like a year uh, probably two years ago and we locked the contract there was no storm no nothing and after we locked it we brought the whole team from south florida all the way to tampa to examine you know we do like a very in-depth inspection and apparently there was a heavy rain the day prior not like a storm but heavy rain and it's an, the whole lot was completely flooded and they had a garage that was a little bit lower compared to the main house. And the garage was completely flooded. And wow. to me, I thank God that if we would have come any other day and it's not raining, we will never know and buy the property. Yeah. So we, we canceled it. You know, we brought a whole team from here. I mean, we spent a lot of money just from like bringing the whole team and everything. It was, and we found out, like, I was like, thank God, but it was insane to think that we can buy a house. You don't know what's going on. And, you know, and, and I had another situation. I, I mean, we're jumping from vacation, right? But talking about like flooding, um, we have a house in East Hollywood, you know, in Florida. And I tried to sell this house for quite some time because the real estate market did slow down. And I was finally under contract. We, they, they already did the inspection. We already like passed the inspection. They wanted to close. And a day before the due diligence ended, there was a big flood. So their agent, they already went back to New York, the buyers, the potential buyers. So their agent was like, hey, is everything okay in the house? The house got completely flooded. So I was like... I don't even know how to respond, like, because I need to understand the damages, you know. And then they actually signed an agreement that we will fix the whole house and they're going to move forward with the purchase. But four days after they changed their mind because they were overwhelmed with like the flooding and everything and they canceled the contract. And, and again, if that was like a week prior or two weeks prior, it will never happen when we had a closed sale. You know, yeah. it's not like you're hiding information, but it's like it's a part of living in Florida. You know, you don't know what's going to happen when there is a heavy rain. Yeah. So yeah. That, that's uh, unique to Florida. Right. Yeah, that is definitely unique. Like I like Dan was saying, all the houses here usually have basements. Um, I've walked into maybe a handful of houses that don't. And we own one rental unit that doesn't. And even that's like a little odd. Yeah. So there's there's big differences in terms of uh, structure of homes and how it all works from state to state, even county to county sometimes. But um, that is one glaring difference from the Midwest to Florida. But it makes sense with your climate, what you got going on. But yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> so we uh, we gave now just a, a brief sneak peek into what you're doing. But just to confirm it for our audience. Can you let them know on like a simple level what it is you do down in South Florida? And then we'll open up some uh, some boxes from there. Awesome. That yeah. Works. So right now, our company focus solely on vacation rental investments throughout Florida. We have about $150 million portfolio. So we have hotels, single families. We have some condos. And that's pretty much what we've been doing in the last seven years, give or take. It, it changed, you know, because Airbnb became more known as a business about seven years ago. It started like maybe a little bit prior to it. And that's really what we're doing in the last few years. Nice. And do you use Airbnb as a Host uh, site. medium? I guess. So yeah. 
Airbnb is giving us probably 70% of all the business. Okay. And the other 30% will be like VRBO, Booking.com. Um, we, we're probably on like seven different channels. And then we also have our own uh, booking site. So for more for like the repeating clients, we have a lot of people in Florida that have like families coming. So they know us. So they contact us. We give them our booking site. Um, but Airbnb, you know, definitely is a, a big chunk of the market. Yeah. Yeah. In that website that you use for um, like if they're going to book directly with you is the design VR. Yes. Dot com. Yeah. Awesome. We'll also put that in the show notes so people can take a look at that and take a look at some of the vacation awesome. homes that you got offered on there. Let's take a look at some of them. Some of them are like luxury. luxury yeah, I, I actually, so cool. I do want to talk about it, you know, how we got into the more uh, luxury properties because it was definitely a process. It's not like the first property we bought. Well, actually, the first property was a very luxury house, but that was how we started. <laughs> that was like a, a mistake, let's call it. It's a house that we tried to a sell. A good mistake. Yeah, it was a beautiful house on the water in Miami that we were wanted to sell. And we said, okay, until we're going to sell it, let's rent it. Uh, and it rented very well. <laughs> so that's yeah. how kind of like everything started. But when we started, we bought a lot of single families in East Hollywood, mostly. It was a really good location for the price. And we noticed that most of the properties were between, let's say, 400,000 to 650. Then it went up to like 800. And I think the more expensive home we have there was purchased for like 1.5 million. And that was like a, you know, new construction, beautiful, modern home. And the market there became very saturated. Like a lot of other companies start coming also to East Hollywood and also, people who bought properties and brought us to us to manage, they just saw the, the money and they start buying more and more and more. And at the end, they when they had a lot of properties, they decided to also be a separate company. So there were like a lot of people in the same area doing pretty much the same thing. And we are always trying to be a step ahead. And we saw where it's heading. So we said, okay, what's the next destination? And then we took a risk in a way we always do like calculative risks, meaning we're going to buy a property that might not necessarily work for the first uh, house, but we're going to buy it in a very good price. The worst case, we're going to resell it. Um, we bought in plantation, which um, to people who don't know plantation is kind of like sovereigns, you know, it, it's not a touristic area. It's maybe 40 minutes from the beach not like i mean you have like a casino maybe like you know 20 minute yeah. drive but you don't really it's not like people say not a oh, walkable... I'm go to plantation in florida for a vacation yeah but the sovereigns have the potential to buy acre lot properties that are you know usually like in a lower price point and the square foot of the house the living square foot is between four thousand to five thousand and we said that if we're going to build a product that can bring people to that area and they don't want to leave, they will probably do it. Bless you. Thank you. So, I'm going to mute. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, what we did there was basically in the acre lot, it's already coming with the pool, you know, always. I mean, it, yeah. there's always like a pool. But in the acre lots, Nobody is really utilizing the space. Like 95% of the homes, it's just grass. Sometimes they put a tennis court and some uh, they, they raise horses, but it's not like, you know, it's a small uh, part of the lot. So we said, let's do amenities in the house that people would just want to stay there. And we start adding basketball court, volleyball courts, uh, artificial grass uh, for uh, soccer, and like picnic area, like we really wanted to give an experience. And that's something that really worked for us. I don't think, I don't want to say nobody else is doing it. Most likely if somebody else is doing it, they saw us doing it. Um, but, but still, it's not a lot. Like you don't have, because the outdoor costs a lot of money and you also need to know how to really do it, you know? Yeah. 
So we were like, it's really working for us. And then we started only to focus on that, which a big part of it was because the increase in the real estate market brought to a point that you cannot get the three, four bedroom homes for a decent price that will make sense return wise. So it's not like we're against it. It's kind of like the market and everything made us do it. So we are very happy with it. I, I feel that that's really what differentiates us from like other companies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, don't get me wrong. If, if we can buy a house for half a million dollars that will work, we'll probably do it. We have a lot of investors coming to us that have like 600,000 and we're telling them that unfortunately there isn't much they can buy unless they want to do like, you know, four or five percent return, which usually yeah. they don't. Um, and those homes are bringing more like nine to 11 percent return. So that's definitely yeah. our niche right now. And that's what we're expanding. And we're also looking to expand to other states right now and to bring the same model. So right now, let's say we're looking into Texas. I haven't seen a house in tech and Texas is huge. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't seen a house that has amenities, you know, like like r- real amenities. You know, we inside the house, like movie theater, pool table, uh, foosball, air hockey, ping pong outside to have all the, the other stuff for uh, that I already mentioned. So that's really exciting for us. I really feel that people will want to pay premium to have something like that. Yeah. So and you're, all right. So you're expanding into Texas and you're finding these places that don't have uh, the amenities you're talking about. Is that something that with what you guys have built and the capabilities you guys have, you'd still purchase that? either for you or for an investor and then put the money into putting those movie theaters, pool table room, uh, maybe a pool, like those type of things. Would you invest that into the property? Right. Or how so, would that work with, with where you guys are at? So, uh, well, first of all, if I will see another area that has a house with amenities that work, that for me will be a much better thing. Like, oh, it's yeah. not like we are looking for areas that don't have it. Uh, it just that they don't. I, I wish they had. So then I can really see the numbers. Um, the way that we're looking at it is that most likely if we don't add the amenities, the house will still generate a good return. I'm talking about like the first homes that we're buying, that we're really like nitpicking the best of the best for under market value, stuff like that. So if we're buying those and in our analysis, even without the courts, the numbers will work. We will still add the courts and we are thinking that it's definitely going to justify it and it's going to make more money. And then worst case, if it's not, so we're still doing okay return. And, you know, because the outside, you know, it's usually without the landscape, it's roughly can be like two to 300,000 depends on what you need to do. So, if you're adding all that, it should give you roughly two hundred to three hundred dollars more per night, and that means it's well justified. And so again, for the first house, even if you don't get it, but the numbers will meaning, let's say without it, you can make thirteen percent return. And let's say we do all that investment, it doesn't work, and it goes down from thirteen to ten it's still worth to try it because there is a higher possibility that it will work. Yeah. And I guess you're not losing in that scenario. Like your profit got cut a little bit, but right. Right. I I just want to clarify, like you're, you're doing, you're, you're buying these houses, you're renovating them, you're making them high end with all the amenities, but these are still vacation rentals. Like you're not flipping these. So we're not flipping, but a big part of the, the whole plan that we have is that in five years we could sell them for an upside. Yeah. So it's not really a flip. We're adding a lot of value to it. Yep. And first of all, to sell a house, one of our thinking is that, you know, people are paying for staging. We're buying like high quality furniture. So it's not stage. It's real furniture. When people come, they already have a a image of how the house can look like. And we thought we saw it as a big benefit. And, we also think that 
the value that all the courts are adding and how easy it's going to be to resell later. So we do see it as a, on top of the annual return, how are we going to profit more for sure? Mm -hmm. So how many, how many of these houses have you put in a, a volleyball court in? So <laughs> I play volleyball um, and I'm saying it, I, I play indoor volleyball, but you know, in those homes, we don't have room for you don't play beach volleyball in Florida. I, no, no, I play, but I play professional indoor. Oh, I got oh, you. really. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that's I play. Cool. That's how I got. That's how I got here to United States. I was supposed to play in New York, actually. Um, really? We missed yeah. all of that in the intro and I'm super sorry. That's very cool. I just I saw yeah, volleyball with an interest just... on your profile. And I my my son is obsessed with volleyball right now. He's 20, 22 years old. He's trying to oh, start nice. up his own little, uh, not little, but his own um, like grassroots type of teaching adults that want to get into it, sixteen nice. and older, about like getting exposed to volleyball. So he's he's there. I think he plays four or five nights a week, and then two different days he runs a three or four hour, uh, like, how would you call it, open gym session? But it's all oh, sand nice. volleyball right now. That's amazing. Yeah, it, it's funny because I took a long break after I stopped playing. And when I got back to playing, I didn't know that there are like still a lot of tournaments and places that I can play. Obviously, I'm 41 now, so I'm not playing like for money, but I'm still playing like competitive. And um, I play against kids 22 <laughs> yeah. years old. So so I, I see how hard it is, you know, when you're when you're 40 plus and you feel like you're 20 and your knees are yeah, disagreeing so with you, you know. <laughs> Yeah, so I definitely see how it is. Up with the body. Uh, but but to go back to the to the real estate, like I really want. I said, listen, we're in Florida. Let's put like volleyball courts, you know. And to to be honest, I don't really think that ninety five percent of the people that reserve with us actually play volleyball. <laughs> I I don't think they use it. It's more for like the pictures and and it's not cheap to build a beach volleyball court. is actually pretty expensive when you do it right. And, you know, and after I pushed it to so many properties, you know, the, the other people in the management, they come to me and like, listen, we need to calm down with the volleyball. It's not worth it. <laughs> what about pickleball? Oh, so so we actually it, it's it's funny, those questions, because now that's what we're doing. Every new property now, pickleball became like such a hot topic that we're actually doing pickleballs. Before the pickleballs, we did tennis courts. Yeah. For us, pickleball is amazing because it's a smaller court. It takes less less uh, space. It costs less money. Yep. Um, we we did one property now that uh, we did like a, a few different courts and we paint them nicely. So one is pickleball, one is basketball. The third one, I just forgot what we put there, but uh, I don't. Maybe it was soccer. I forgot, but uh, it, it looks very nice. But yeah, pickleball for sure. It's it's insane how big it is uh, here. I don't know with in you got you know in in your state how it is, but it's definitely it's big. And a it's lot getting of, bigger here, yeah. And a lot of the people that play here, that I play with, are older generation, so they're sixty plus, and they talk about going to Arizona or Florida all the time because they're snowbirds. So they'll leave here over the winter months and they'll look for playing opportunities down there. And it's it's the new golf, you know. It, it is, used it to is. be golf, yeah. now it's pickleball. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. By the that's way, that's the next thing. You got to put a golf course on a property. What? You got to put a golf course on a property. Yeah, right. So we we're we're putting a mini golf. Uh, we're oh, that's doing. cool. Yeah, yeah. Like we put synthetic grass. Uh, we were thinking about doing like super nice uh, um, mini golf, meaning you know, like when you go to play in a like a professional uh, <laughs> mini golf place. That they do all the, I don't know, they put a clown and you need to. Yeah. 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 But th that's really pricey. So we're not there yet. Like we, you know, we don't think it's really <laughs> going to justify the price. Question yeah. like, Question to go back. How much does it cost to in, to put in a pickleball court, if you don't mind sharing, roughly? Roughly, it's about 25K. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That is. Way we more we do everything in house right now. I mean, I'm, I'm yeah. sure that if you're going to call a company, it's probably going to cost more. I got space right here, right next to me on the ground to put a pickleball court in. My dad would love it. I would love it. Yeah. yeah and then you put it and you don't play. That, no, I would, I would be playing. I would be playing. Yeah. Dan would play pickleball. That is for sure. 
<laughs> um, the other thing that we're seeing up here um, uh, in condos, apartments, I haven't really gone into any Airbnbs and things, but the the golf simulators, <clears throat> they're carving out in our basements. Yeah, They carve out uh, a little space to put netting, and then that's like the amenity they're putting in. And you'll see you it. Need, you need a 10 foot ceiling for those. So the, some, some basements will be yeah. tough unless you have a more luxury style home. Cause I know you got, but those are all the newer buildings that are being built that. Right. So here to too, to in Florida, uh, a lot of the new buildings have the golf simulator. Um, I suggested it as well. It's a process, you know, like you, you, we, we're becoming like, really good in setting up one thing that it takes usually like seven months just to really become really good at that yeah and then to start adding more things it, it's it's pretty much like endless in a way you know there's all there's so many things you can add yeah. um i agree but then you when you're thinking about like vacation rental side you know you put a simulator p people abuse your stuff you know oh, yeah. you have to put like commercial stuff you don't really uh, watch them all the time to really know, you know, what they're doing with the club, what it, I don't know, they're going to right, 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 right. Gonna yeah. damage it in a way. Absolutely. You know? no, I get that. Um, and I guess a little bit of it is, is trial and error, like what yeah, you put for in sure. and how they break it or how they mess it up. And you're like, all right, next time we build it, we're going to have to secure this because obviously that happens. Yeah, even the type of furniture, you know, I mean, we're trying to buy a really high quality furniture that people will buy to their own home. It's not like, a, and that's, and we can talk about it too. It's a whole subject that a lot of people that thinking that Airbnb is going to be like a, such an easy side hustle and they try to save money. They buy like furniture in Ikea or and stuff like that. And and they have no clue what's really going to happen in a few months, you know, and it's not just to break. It's if you don't have the experience after it break, how do you deal with like Airbnb for returns? If you have a check out and check in the same day, so they check out at 11 a.m. The next check in is at, at four. You just found out at like 12 that something broke. You need to replace it ASAP. Yeah, you got three uh, hours. Is, what? You got like three hours to fix yeah, it. Yeah, you have like three hours. So, so what do you do? You know, and maybe you, you say, ah, I'm not going to replace it. So trust me, people now in Airbnb, the guests, they feel that they it doesn't matter if they pay 100 a night or 2000 a night, they want five star experience. And they're going to complain about, you know, we have homes that is like <laughs> 5000 square foot homes and they're going to find like one bug in the whole house and they're going to say, Oh, there are bugs. I'm like, you know, I mean, it, it makes sense. It's Florida, 5,000 square foot. You, there might be a bug coming in from an acre lot. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, and we deal with that deal here with. too. Like on the long-term leases, like people see one thing and they're like, it's everywhere. Yeah. You're like, <laughs> yeah, you live in a woodsy area. Like that's where bugs live and the house right. is not completely sealed. Yeah. At least I we don't have alligators cool. yet, you know. That's <laughs> yeah. I'm glad we don't have those. <laughs> no. And I'm hoping that you've never had a call of an alligator being in one of your rentals. No, no. But, but you know what? I <laughs> I saw on YouTube once. I had a house that it was by a lake, and a lot of ducks came from the lake to the pool, and they pooped yep. all over the the area there, the deck, and we were really like, you know. We try so many things, nothing worked. And I saw on YouTube, if you buy like an alligator, um, uh, what do you call it? Coyote. A floating, uh, like a floater in the pool that looks like an alligator. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you put it in the pool and they stop jumping in. <laughs> really? Yeah. That's a good idea. Uh, so we tried that. That's as close as I got to an alligator. <laughs> they make them now that are like RC cars. Or RC boats, you can just drive them around. Right. That's the next level thing there. Yeah. Well, um, actually, that's something I wanted to do as well. Uh, I was very close that when the market started shifting. I was under contract on a house that was two acres, and like almost an acre of it was a huge lake, private. And the the owners that sold it, they had jet skis and stuff like that, and it's private. It's amazing. So I wanted to do something like that, like when you put like a you know a really nice. Uh, kind of like a, a boat, but it looks like either a car or something like that. 
Um, but the market changed and then, you know, the rates were so high. So it was too much for that specific uh, deal. So we actually got out of it. <laughs> yeah. That and with that, I that mean, was... if you if you have a jet ski on a property like that, or those, you're going to have a higher liability or insurance coverage, right? N yeah, no, no, we wouldn't put a jet ski. The, oh. I'm just saying the previous one for us, we will put like kayaking and, and okay. stuff like that. Like yeah, yeah. Just stand up paddle. No motors. Stand. Yeah, no. Yeah, no motors. Which is also, you know, like one house we bought, they had a, a it was an acre lot, but it was very long. Like you know, it was kind of like. Um, the, the one side was super long and they had a beautiful zip line from one side to the other. Like they built like a tree house and then they had the zip line. And when I first saw it, I'm like, Oh, that's amazing. And everybody told me, no, that's a liability. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we have to get rid of it. So that it's like, you know, that's a sad stuff in like, sometimes you want to do super nice stuff, but you know, liability wise, it's like you, you're thinking about every little thing right now. Yeah. Yeah. And you think about like the caution coffee hot. And like even if you like warn people and have them sign waivers, they're still gonna hurt themselves on something. Right. And unfortunately, it's on and when your you're on property. vacation, people think vacation equals alcohol and drinking and whatever other type of party and they're trying to do. So people get crazy or stupid sometimes when they it, it's all it's also like you know, it doesn't matter, like you guys are saying, how much careful you are at the end, you know, it's your house and reviews is literally like number one thing that you have to be above like 4.85. And it, yeah. it's so easy to fall very quickly bef between the cracks, like if you're not on top of your reviews. So if people want to, you know, complain about something, uh it, it, it's going to show right away so for sure we're trying to limit as much as possible like all the bad stuff that can happen yeah you know yeah definitely um you alluded to something early and i wanted to get into it because before the show you talked about uh the progression of your career you used to be in more of the the management in terms of building and now you're now focusing more on the uh acquisition side of it can you walk us through um, kind of what is your process to find properties or do you look at how many investors you have in and what they're looking for to go target properties? Like how, what is your mindset when you're sitting there looking, all right, we got to pick up another property. Where do you go from there? And then we'll go into like, how do you structure deals? Right. Okay. Perfect. You. Good question. Yeah. So when I first started with the acquisition side it was more like okay there is a current investor he wants to buy a house for a specific price what can i find that changed with time because we almost always have investors in line and we know that if there is a good deal we'll be able to close it so the way that we're doing it now in order to be more efficient so we're identifying the properties, which I'll get into, and then we're going to start the negotiation process, lock the deal. Only once we're locking the deal, we're going to give it to the first in line that we have in mind that that will fit him or the group that we have uh, in mind. And if they say no, we usually go to the next uh, in line. We haven't had yet that if a house was good, we had to let go of it. Um, there were times that we closed contracts and then we checked a few things and then we had to back out during the due diligence period. But especially nowadays where with the current market in Florida, where it's still like very high um, pricing, you know, for the, for the homes, it's, we're really nitpicking like a lot of properties. The negotiations are way more lengthy it takes sometimes three months to negotiate just to close a contract and almost always, and I'm saying it like in a way like that, it's unfortunately every time we're doing inspections, we're, tr we, we need, we, we have to renegotiate the price. So think about like three months, we're negotiating a deal that we're bringing them to the most bottom price possible. 
And then after inspection period, we have to lower more. We're not the type, the type of company just to try to squeeze people uh, as much as possible. It's more because that two things. We have to lower the numbers in a way that it will fit our performa, that we can make the 9 10% return. Mm -hmm. So a lot of nice homes just overpriced, not necessarily overpriced, even if it's like market price, they're just not going to work for us, but they're still beautiful homes. So we yeah. will try to get them for a lower price. And then the second thing is that we're buying very unique homes that it's so hard to find comparables in the same area sometimes. So the price might make sense, but then if we're buying with the loan, you bring an, in, uh, an appraiser and he, it's really hard for him to find comps. And sometimes it's not in the price of the contract. Now, when we're closing the deal, we're assuming that unless they're already given like information about, let's say the age of the roof or stuff like that, if we're assuming that everything is good and we find out, uh, and that's something we learn with time that there is almost always issues with leaking in the pool, uh, pool leaks. It, it's mm -hmm. amazing how many leaks in the pool. And, and then uh, most of the properties here, which I will, I don't know if it's in your area the same, but it's like septic tanks. Uh, yeah, there's still some up here, yeah. So homes that are like 30-year-old, 40-year-old, the septic always have issues, you know. Uh, back in the days, there were cast iron plumbing. Now it's like PVC. But if it's cast iron, always issues. <laughs> so yeah. so it's, that you you know, when you're closing the contract, you're assuming, okay, everything is more like, let's say, cosmetic. But then you find out like so many things that you have to lower the price. So it's very like draining, you know, like emotionally draining. You already invested. You already, just for inspection, we're paying like $2,000 just for the inspection part because we're wow. doing. So Are many. you doing multiple inspectors, like a home yeah. inspector, a pool inspector, a so septic? We're doing sewer camera. We're doing regular inspection, roof inspection, pool leak detection, which is a separate company, septic. They actually open the septic. They, you know, so yeah, each company is like. You guys down in Florida have a bug termite inspector? Yes. Because I, I heard from a friend that we got some cockroach problem down in Florida. Uh not really roaches, but uh, definitely there are um, <clears throat> uh, termite for sure. I mean, it's yeah. not really bugs, but termites. Yes, we do yeah. have uh, Termite, termite. termites are everywhere. Like that comment was not to, to scare any of the listeners. There's bugs <laughs> everywhere. It's not just I Florida. Even ask. <laughs> um, but no, but, like up here, it's now being added into offers to purchase. Um with that specific like termite inspector, the yeah. normal building inspectors or home inspectors will not touch those things. So, Just so, like so, chimneys are their own separate inspector. Oh, chimney is another annoying thing. There's always a problem with the yeah. chimney. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if like there is a fireplace, I'm like, no. Um, I know. So regarding the termites, I think because maybe it's more uh, like like Florida is so big into it that most of the inspectors, even if you don't pay them for a specific termite inspection, they're looking for it and they will tell you if they see something. So usually the way that we do it, and so far we saw that it's money-wise, it is uh, the most uh, like efficient way is that we're not really paying for a termite inspection, but the regular inspector is checking for it. And if he sees it, then we bring a termite inspection. Um, it's an issue. I mean, molds can be an issue as well uh, that we're trying to really be careful. You know, some people try to hide it. Uh, I unfortunately had to move from my previous house. Uh, well, my wife decided we're gonna move due to mold. <laughs> And I try to fight it as, as someone who has experience with like uh, construction and everything. We ripped up the walls, everything. It just, it did not go away. Uh, so we're really mm. being careful as much as we can. You know, there's only so much you can do. Um, but that's why in Florida, the new construction, it's concrete. Nobody built from wood uh, here anymore. But the old homes, they will have those uh, issues. I mean, yeah. can have those issues. So they're doing exterior walls as concrete now too? 
Yes, yes. Okay. That would make sense to probably hold up a little bit better with the storms coming through. Yeah, so you know, to if if you're connecting it now with the insurance costs, if you're buying a house that was uh, built like with the concrete, I don't really see a reason why to pay twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year for wind. Where first of all, the house been there for like you know at least twenty years, some some right. of them forty years, they never flew away, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Like, so, so like what 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 I'm where where am I gonna get my money back? So you're saying you know maybe something happened the roof stuff, I mean roof will cost you like thirty thousand let's say so if you know. You're saving on the wind and something happened so just buy a roof you know kind of like how we look at it but again it's only if we're buying, uh, cash if we're buying like as an investment uh, you know company that like a few people are into the deal more like a fund or syndication so we usually gonna do it just because we want to protect everybody you know and not take risk but if it's a private buyer sometimes they say let's not do the win yeah they can waive that because if at the end of the well at the end of the day end of the year you're still putting in less money by just buying the new roof than paying the premium every month for your wind insurance right and again it's not going to happen every year i mean even if it happened the first year let's say yep. which sucks and you buy a new roof you're going to have first of all a new roof so it's going to add value to the house but still you're going to probably for at least five years not going to have another storm that you know fly your roof it's it's more going to be maybe like a tree that is falling on it or something so if it's a newer roof, you're not gonna need to replace the whole roof. Like, yeah. So what I'm hearing is, is if you were a smart business person, you would create a roofing company and move down to Florida. First of all, <laughs> roofers here are making a killing uh, yeah. during storms. The roofers are making absolutely a killing. By the way, in, in Texas, last last storm, a lot of people from Florida went to Texas to close roof deals. They made a fortune. Um, also I, I will say more than a, than a roofing company become a public adjuster, public adjusters are making a lot of money during storms. Um, and, and by the way, from storms, if you're asking me from investor point of view, I love storms. We're making a lot of money when there are storms. Every time a house is flooded, we're, we're making probably like we're, we're repairing the whole house. We're making it newer. And we're still getting like probably twenty, thirty thousand dollars on top of it to keep in the pocket. You know, we have a, a one house that uh, is in a flood zone that already got damaged three times, and the investor is the happiest person. <laughs> He's like every time, oh, I'm going. That, that's going to cover for all the losses that you know I was doing. <laughs> yeah. So, so some people are happy with that, you know. Interesting. I, I, uh, I managed, uh, like you mentioned the storm like five years ago. So, so I, five years ago, I managed a 50 unit building that got damaged in that storm. And it was, for me, it was my first experience as like a whole building that got damaged where it's like fully occupied. It was a nightmare, but the owners, they made to their pocket around $2 million just from that, from like the supposedly damages, but you know, they yeah. on top of like the, their upside was like 2 million to their pocket. So as much as it was a headache, I mean, they got a renovated, more renovated building and they got money in their pocket. So in Florida, we're okay with it. If you're protected, I mean, you know. Yeah, that's the big thing. Yeah, yeah. I've heard of like roofing and siding companies mobilizing, like they're, main niche area is i don't know south carolina or somewhere close right but they'll actually move and it's more beneficial for them to house the crew down in florida after a storm pick up all those jobs and then when when they i don't know they're done with all their contracts they just go back home but they live in florida for three months by the month. way i i can tell you an easy way for people to make money that you don't need to be a genius you don't need to have a lot of money before storm, go, I'm talking about like a month before, not two days, because then you're not going to have anything. Go to Home Depot, buy all the plywood, and then go knock on doors and cover their uh, windows. 
people who don't yeah. have impact windows or don't have accordion shutters, people will pay you good money for it because people are, you know, every time there is somebody that can be scared, people can make money out of it, you know? Yeah. yeah. We used to cover them. all our houses, every storm, but then we saw that it just doesn't make sense. Like, you know, it's, it's just not worth this. It's a lot of money that we're spending just to cover them. Um, you know, nowadays a lot of more houses have already impact windows, stuff like that. So it just, it's not the same. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Um, <clears throat> do you guys see yourself continuing with the same, um, model because you're talking about going to, to texas are you going to replicate that same model or do you guys foresee something with uh with where the market is right now what you're finding in texas do you guys feel yourself like pivoting a little bit or are you going to try to take what you've created and then implement it kind of the same template in texas yeah. or whatever other areas you go into yeah so so there there are a few ways that we're looking into it um, again, we, we start doing all the stuff, um, because of the market. So if the market in a way will change, we might, uh, also put a lot of efforts in different aspects of the market. For example, multifamilies, we would love to buy hotels, uh, really hard to find those right now, like the, to make sense. People are selling them at like supposedly five six percent which usually it's not really five six percent and then there are always issues and then if you're getting now let's say a six percent mortgage with the rates that went down every it's like six percent it's just not make, making any sense to buy hotels and nobody is selling hotels for like eight percent cap or stuff like that it just it doesn't happen yeah. um so if that market will will kind of like change because people have been talking about it for the last few years that it will change um so we will be ready like we'll buy those as well and then maybe we can shift our focus because those are bigger projects you know that might be more lucrative but we will never really like stop what we're doing with the amenitized homes for sure yeah. that will stay in our model uh, and we will we do want to duplicate it into other places because that what making us unique that's what we know how to do um however another thing that we have is so we have a software i'm not personally the owner of the software but we have a software that was at the beginning an in-house software that we were the only one who used it and then we decided to split it into uh, basically the, the design vr will use that the software as a as a side company, meaning we are paying for the software, even though it's the same owner in a way. Um, so the software, it's called Boom. Boom, uh, if you're going to Google like boomnow.com, it's a very big uh, software that right now uh, people all over the world are using for vacation rental segment. It's more for like bigger accounts. And what we are looking from our point of view in design VR is that we're going to, we have all of the sudden a lot of information about a lot of investments all over the world. So let's say people are using it in Portugal, Spain, France, Greece, Africa. We have numbers in each place, how much the returns that they're doing, you know, how busy it is, what people That's are paying per useful. night. And then we can say that our next investment will be in, for example, Greece. You know, I'm not saying it will be Greece, but we all of the sudden have a lot of information that we can utilize. And that's something that for sure will happen in a few years. But I think the more immediate, like what's going to happen soon will be something like Texas, you know, for example. Uh, me personally, I am doing other stuff. Like I am investing right now in a hotel in Zanzibar, Africa, for example. So it's Oceanfront Hotel. And I am going to expand also there. Um, and once we're going to, for example, bring the software to Zanzibar. So maybe Design VR will invest in Zanzibar. You know, so again, it's more like a private thing, but I'm just showing you how we are looking at things to grow, you know, so yes. the company will not just go all over for like adventures, but when they see that there are already like existing numbers, so then we're definitely looking to expand. Um, 
and our clients want diversity you know they if someone is buying with you let's say you have like a family office to buy with you like five six properties then they're like okay what's that like the next destination or other locations they don't want to just be too much saturated in one area to do the same yeah. thing so we need to give them the answer you know yeah well you found it with uh zanzibar and i hope i'm not the only one with this question how did you find the property in zanzibar so it has to be a wild situation yeah um well i i will tell you but but i'll tell you also you know the important for us to go to a different country we have to have an operator that we feel comfortable and trust that we we can work together the boots so, on the ground person right yeah we have to like like we're not just gonna start hiring from here if we see a potential in in another place it's not gonna happen um so specifically about there um it's more about a story of my best friend uh, and it's more like his story is more uh, interesting than mine <laughs> i just joined him um so my best friend, he actually went to Zanzibar seven years ago to propose to his wife. Okay. And he fell in love with the place. And he actually, we used to work together here in, uh, Cal I, I also li lived in California for a bit. So we did some stuff in California. Uh, and then I moved, he had a solar company. Uh, he sold it, he went back to Israel. And he was like already in his like mid thirties, and he's like, I'm not married yet. I, you know, like he had the crisis, I guess. <laughs> so very quickly he met like his future wife. He was like, you know, and and she's great. So they went to Zanzibar. He fell in love with uh, Zanzibar, and he he said, you know, a lot of things are missing here. And then he found a lot that was very cheap in uh, Africa. You know, it's it's cheap. And he said, listen, you feel comfortable like, talking about price. Like what is cheap in Zanzibar, Africa? So back then, I mean, seven years ago, I think he bought it for like uh, 300 K. I mean, that was the price of a oceanfront lot, you know, oh. how many acres? Uh, it was like an acre, uh, not acre. Um, I know. I think, like two, I think, I think like two acres or something like that. Okay. Something, something around there. Uh, again, I, I'm not a part of that hotel, uh, right now it's a hotel, but so, so the way his story started is that, you know, he said, first of all, he's one of the best salesperson I know, like he's a really good salesperson. And I'm saying it because he thought that he will put money down for a land, which he put like maybe 30,000 and he was pretty not broke, but 30,000 was pretty much what he had, you know? And he said, I'm going to go back to Israel and I'm going to bring uh, investors and close the land. And it's amazing. And again, he's a really good salesperson. He went back to Israel and every person he talked to was like, what do you have to do with Zanzibar? Like now you're coming with Zanzibar. Like you have zero. Ex First of all, he has zero, zero experience in real estate. So he's like, why will we invest in the you know, you just saw the country for the first time. Now you want to do a hotel and stuff. People thought he was crazy. Mm -hmm. um but he didn't give up you know and i think that's very inspirational that like it doesn't matter how no you how many times you hear the the word no he didn't give up and then he ended up finding a person that was very experienced in the hotel administry that he paid him for consultation for one meeting and he met him he gave him the 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 vision that he saw and the other guy told him, I want to be your partner. So they actually became Must partners. Must have been a good vision. Wow. It was a great vision. Uh, yeah. They're actually, they, he built a five-star hotel, 86 units. That hotel is number one on TripAdvisor right now in Zanzibar. He's doing amazing. Since then, he built a few more hotels. And, and I was one of those people that he came at the very beginning and he said, hey, let's invest. And I said, you Zanzibar, what you know, not yet. But I told him, listen, you definitely have the abilities. So once you do have all the experience, then I can set up a lot of you know funds that will go toward your way, and we can do a lot of stuff. 
So I actually waited a very long time to have a good opportunity plus yeah. experience plus to show numbers for the last two years of returns, you know? Yeah. Uh, and to me, like, so he's an operator, you know, that I definitely trust. And that's the only reason, like, even if you give me the same, like the same opportunity, but he's not there, I wouldn't go there, you know? Um, so er it doesn't matter to me. I'm also looking in Guatemala right now, but Guatemala, it's the same thing. I, I will not go there if I don't have an operator I can trust. So yeah. there it's probably not going to be my best friend. But for sure, someone that we know personally that can show us track record, because those things you really need to be careful, you know, for sure. And and then there are there are other companies like, the, you know, like, for example, Hilton, right? They also have a hotel in Zanzibar. I'm sure the Hilton, the, you know, themselves didn't have like a best friend there. They just saw an opportunity and they brought their team. Yeah. So you could you can do it, but you need someone on ground that represent you uh, for sure. But, but that's as a company how we see like to involve. Yeah. And the, the boots on the ground, the project manager, property manager, whatever you want to call them, uh, whatever investing you're doing, whether it be short term, long term flips, the most important piece to that is the person that can get there. Like that needs to be able to step on the lot and figure out what's going on, um, you're you're handicapped if you don't have that. And you're you know, very vulnerable. I, I'll give you an example. So there is a guy we've been working with, uh, I've been working with, uh, we did a few flips and he always had great deals. And one day he came to us and he gave me a deal that he was like three and a half hours, which is far enough for me not to, to, to rarely see it, you know? Um, but I, I saw everything like from far away. I didn't even go there. The numbers worked. So um, I, I we, we ended up buying it. And I actually lost a lot of money on that deal. Now, why did I lose the money? Was be because as much as I, that guy did business with us, that specific business, I mean, that specific like home, uh, we got really screwed up, like like screwed. We we pay him a lot in advance because we've been working with uh, already in other deals, and he did not brought he didn't bring the actual right people to do the renovation that was needed. And you know what? I did the analysis, like so so I did check before myself. I didn't trust anybody else. I I checked all the numbers. I end up selling it at a big loss, and whoever bought it from me at the loss put the money that I was that I paid him to do the same renovation. Literally, they did exactly what I wanted to do. It wasn't like a high-end thing. It was like a flip. And they sold it for exactly the same price that I put on the analysis, like three months after. Really? Yeah. So so you definitely need someone, like 100% that you trust. I mean, Tampa, for example, I go very often to look at properties and I always stay there for a few days. But at the same time, we have in-house people there like you know we have a couple project managers that are there and we have other people in our team that goes there every very often and we we have to you know yeah no it's an important piece to the team um you talk about the team that you have in south florida working with you when you go across borders or across countries in that case with zanzibar still need to bring the team it's still an important piece to it, but so, so um, for example, if we'll go to Texas, you know, for example, the first few homes, we'll probably use a local management company that we most likely will not really know personally, but we're definitely going to look into them, see their track record. We'll see how many properties they manage. Uh, so, so we're okay with that. You know, I'll be on the line, like flying there often. Um, we are okay with that. You know, again, yeah. I'm sure it's not going to be like, even if you have a great team, when you're doing something yourself, it's different. You know, you go there, you see it in your eyes. It's always different when it's your own thing that you're, you know, that you're doing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you, you need to a good team, you know? <laughs> yep. And like you said, it's not always your friend, but you do have to make the phone calls. And we've had a couple of shows with people that invest out of state, uh, cross country, all that kind of stuff. And, um, vetting a property manager 
is important. Even if you don't know them, you got to know, like you were saying, how many properties you manage. One is what do they manage? Are they managing more long-term properties or are they a property manager for short-term rentals? And do they have the capability, like you mentioned earlier in the show, uh, checkout is 11 a.m., something's broken, next check-in is four. Can that property manager, when you're in Florida and your house is in Texas, get there in that three-hour window? Yeah, of course. Or are they not capable of doing that? Because then your boots in the ground is not really... Uh, and, and I think functional. that the people who work for you, they, they have to be happy, you know, like, like, for example, Zanzibar, a nice salary for a hotel manager is like 2,500 in Zanzibar, right? Which it sounds like ridiculous, but it's considered like a pretty decent paycheck uh, a month. Uh, the guy that we have there, that is basic, but he's supposed to end up making like 7,000 to 8,000 a month where everything's uh, stabilized and it's a very very high uh, income for someone like that in Zanzibar like it's extremely high but we are like if we all make money you know you should be very happy and you're like the leader in a way I mean if you're the property manager for a nice hotel that is bringing great numbers to the investors you should be happy you should be compensated and and, and if not they you know they're probably not going to leave but it's going to show on the yeah, they're also not going to try very hard. So for sure to have people that are good in what they do, but also to keep them happy. Because if they're not happy, they're going to look for something else if they're good. Yeah. I just heard a term, I think it was like passively quitting. Like Passive? if they don't feel like they're, yeah, pa passively quitting. They're not going to quit. Oh, yeah, like, yeah. Like, yeah. are you going to get their best effort? No. Yeah. And that's the, that's the line you got to play with and, and, I mean, anytime you fall below it, you're uh, you're in trouble of losing your your team and your support. A hundred percent. I mean, your team is everything. You know, there's only so much you can do by yourself. Yeah, for I sure. Agree. What What do you guys do there? Like from like investments and stuff like that. Uh, we started out with, um, I mean, any investment we have, it's either going to be in our our rental. Part of it which is our buy and hold long-term leases we haven't dabbled into airbnb or short term um and it's all very local so we haven't expanded zanzibar seems like a different planet to what our <laughs> investing is uh and then we have a renovations where we flip homes and they're a quicker transaction so you kind of dab with so, so what returns do you see there for right now in today's market for long term uh returns on like turnkey properties because like, like long-term investments I, I know are you asking for like what do we cash flow on properties for like, like return wise yeah what is your cap rate on like properties that you're buying right now for long term cap rate as of recent i would say it's closer to five wow yeah and they're all single family homes like we haven't broken into any multifamily yet because when we started getting into it, when we started, we wanted to go into rentals and I'll admit my purchase took our company in a completely different direction. We bought a house. We were just going to do a roof repair to it. We found out that everything was framed incorrectly. Mm. So it turned into either we sell the property, take our 20K loss. I think it was around 20K and just selling it as a lot and let the next person go in. Or we need to get somebody who can build a house. So we end up opening up a construction company. <laughs> so our, our, uh, I feel bad for our number, numbers on the rental market because we don't have any really recent in the last, say, two years. Got it. Everything you've been doing has been pumping the construction company. So what, what do you see from flip side, like return over there? Um, 15, yeah, I think I was, maybe a bit closer to 15 to 20 percent. Yeah, it was. I was gonna go 15 because I'm conservative with that, and it's usually like a year or less, less than a year. Okay, it's not, yeah. it's not bad. We've had a flip that lasted longer than a year, and that was the one I was referencing where it was like, got it, man, it went, it went backwards so many times where I didn't even, all right, now we're at 
we're our backs against the wall. And then you find out that that wall was not structural. It was just a partition. So you blow through that and you're like, okay, we can't go back any further than this. <laughs> and then you find your floor system is screwed up. So then you go back even farther. That one start and stop so many times. That project was not, not a great one. Yeah, but that's but made you who you are today. <laughs> you learn a lot from it. Yeah. But by the way, when you're saying like 5% re uh, return, so I used to manage long-term hundreds of units. I mean, I used to manage. I used to be, I started as a property manager. And the returns that we gave to investors after management, everything was about 8%. Mm -hmm. Like very accurate. Like the average was 8%. Uh, cop rate uh which was great uh you know that was like seven six and until six seven years ago and backward and one of the reasons why i personally wanted to get into the airbnb was because the same investors that wanted to buy more i was like there is not i mean that's how i made my money so i'm like there's nothing i can find anymore Because the yeah. returns became like 6%, you know, then it's like yeah. five. Um, so yeah, I hear you. Like it's, it's definitely, you know. It's, yeah. It's when tough. you try to run numbers on things, like a 10% is almost non-existent anymore, at least in the single family space. How, how is it is for you guys to find like, uh, to do flips, like for 15%, stuff like that? Like, is it, Is it easy to find the deal? And it's more about like finding cash? the deal. Yeah. Finding the deal is the hardest thing. Yeah. And, uh, and structuring is, is difficult now too. We're, we're going, we're leaning now the direction of getting less off of traditional financing with interest rates and in all the fees that are associated with the holding costs are a little bit higher. We're hoping that if we go with the non-traditional uh, lending, We're going to save some room there. You mean like hard money lending or? Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah, there's no, not, not a lot of cash is going into the deals. It's all private yeah. hard money. And what is like an average cost for like a flip? Do you, do you have like an average cost or? It depends on what kind of property we're in. And the one thing that we, we're running into because prices are so high, holding costs are so high. You're your window of opportunity to improve the property is going to go down because most of your capitals, not most, yeah, majority of your capitals is going to go into purchase and holding. And if, if we were four years ago with interest rates that were unbelievably low, like you have a wider window to hit more areas and get your property to the next level. The last couple that we've done minus, we bought the oldest home in this community and we, Obviously, you know, no walls were parallel. Nothing was running how it should. How old was it? Oh, and I think that was not 19... 25, 28? I was going to put 20. So like 100 years old. Yeah, it was an old, old home. Yeah. It had the original carpet in it. Wow. Like that's yeah, it was <laughs> it was some like gross uh carpet in the bathroom it was weird it in the it was weird the bathroom took up half of the floor plan on the second story so the bedrooms were super small but oh. the bathroom was like bigger than both <laughs> bedrooms it was super weird so we moved that around a little bit um but in order to do what we really wanted to do to make the house operable in like actually function, you put more cost in than what you'd really want to do to get your return. Yeah. And then it was the teeter totter of like, all right, do we make yeah. this good or do we make our profit higher? And that was like one of those things where do you buy those homes? Like from a, like as a, from a wholesaler or like, uh, we bought them all off market, off market. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, that's for me something I noticed here because I'm personally will still love to do good flips. Right. Um, and I know wholesalers, I know like people send me like off market stuff, but then it's always like, you know, if everything goes perfect, 
it's like 15 <laughs> percent but yeah. then you're like well if you know things go south then you're like eight percent and then for the eight percent to waste so much time plus the market here how, how long in, in average it takes you to sell a house from what the day it hits the market the last thing i read was like 45 days is okay, it's average. not it's not bad like right. i have your homes that you know, now specifically, maybe because of elections or maybe because people are waiting, you know, with, with the, for the interest to go down. I, I don't get a lot of calls um, for people that buy want to buy for the like as an end user. I'm not talking about like investors because investors, you're always going to have investors. Yeah. Um, so it's really hard. So when I'm thinking about like a potential flip, let's say I'm saying, OK, 12 percent, which is OK if it's six months. But then all of the side, you can get stuck with it for like six months on the market just standing um so i'm being super cautious about like flips right now here yeah and we are as well because it's it's tough like you run the numbers that you find off market and uh they're either posted on forums on the internet or facebook marketplace yeah. or and you run your numbers on those and man the the margins are so tight um and, and then I here you with, you you always gonna hear it like the Latinos, you know, the GC that like being did construction like Cuba or something. They come to you, they oh, I can do it with no permits. Don't worry, half the price. <laughs> and yeah. you always get caught. You always get screwed. It's almost like double the price at the end, you know. I know, I don't know, and I don't know if uh, with it being such a a seller's market, I guess on this point, everything is going retail pricing. So it's hard to find yeah. those like those discounted, discounted. distressed properties. Yeah. And that's what we've done in the past is getting all these distressed, old, outdated, yeah. like really a lot of deferred maintenance properties. But now more and more of those are like, all right, we'll we'll buy it retail. And it's like, oh, right. well, that was that was our business. Plus model. for flips. I mean, it's just have a to little pay, transition. You pay 50 percent uh, taxes, you know, if you're doing the flip less than a year. People don't really think about it uh, right away, you know, unless you do some sort of like 1031 or something. But it's also something that people are saying, oh, I'm going to make 12 percent. I'm like, but you're paying like half, you know, to for taxes unless you're holding it more than like a year at least. But I don't know. People don't really have like the whole analysis usually. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But it takes a while to get that. And yeah, yeah, uh, for sure. I just hope that people, if they get excited into this, do love that side of it. Because that's where things get a little fishy. The details in those. Yeah. You need to enjoy what you do. That's first of all. Oh, definitely. <laughs> then, it sounds like you, know you do, which is very cool. Um, I think you're only one of, maybe we've had two two or three guests, you including one of them, that does uh, short-term vacation rentals. And it's always been a, a little niche of real estate that I've been interested in. But for me, and I don't know why, the risk is so much higher because it could sit vacant. And that to me is like, I was just, you have overcome that and you obviously know that that is a false worry because right. it sounds like everything is getting uh, pretty active on your spots. But, but that, that little question of like ah is it going to get rented this weekend well it, you always have we you always have fear right for new adventures i mean it's always a fear even for me if i'll go to zanzibar it doesn't matter how long i've seen everything it, it, there is a fear you know because you put a lot of your own uh, money into it um i mean you have softwares like air dna that work yeah. you know through airbnb and they give you pretty good numbers about occupancy in some areas and stuff like that um if you're doing it yourself for the first time and that by the way that, that's something that i've noticed that i'm trying to educate people about not just like it's good to jump in the water but a lot of people like they jump into the water thinking something is so easy when they don't know the full scope so i'm not saying to be scared of doing stuff, but the problem is most people don't do the correct homework for new stuff. Um, I have a few homes that are I posted for rent and every house I have for rent, I know exact numbers of what it will do in Airbnb. And 
I get so many calls from people that said, oh, can I rent it? I'll pay you a few months in advance. Can I do sublease to it for Airbnb? Or, yeah. and, and now they start like giving you stories like, oh, I'm going to live in the old house, but can I rent one room for Airbnb? I'm like, look, I don't care about the stories. You, you can go ahead and rent for Airbnb, but I'm telling you that you will lose money. Uh, like yeah. I know for a fact that you will lose money. Now, I'm not saying it, you know, if someone will want to pay me for rent, I mean, after he knows the details, I'm like, okay, I yeah. warn you, right? Usually after I warn them, they don't <laughs> move forward, right? But But that's something that, a lot of people they see on YouTube all those videos. I'm not gonna mention names, but there are some people who talk about it, like how good and easy and how much money you can make subleasing a property, and you, how you can make you know a thousand here, two thousand here. You just get like uh, five properties, and boom, you're making like eight to ten thousand a month. I'm like, no, you're not. You know, first of all, you're buying furniture that minimum, minimum, minimum like thirty thousand dollars, and you buy them for thirty thousand dollars. It's going to take you a, a length, a long time to cover that $30,000. And you have zero homes so far. You don't know really, you know, where to advertise, how to deal with the people, who's going to be your yeah. cleaning crew. I, like people don't know. Now, I'm not saying they cannot make money. I'm saying that they're coming into it without knowing anything. And usually if it's my friends, you know, want to do it, I'm like, you can do it. But then they keep asking me like, a hundred questions and it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> you know, yeah. like they keep asking questions. They don't do it. And I, and I tell those people, you know what? And it doesn't matter if it's us, someone else, if you really want to start and you feel like you got a, a good deal, use a management company that yes, it will take most of your money. It will take most of your profits, but at least from that management company, if it's your first property, Learn all the ropes, like how to do stuff. How how yep. do you deal with clients? Where do you advertise? How how to decide how much to charge per night? Like so many questions. Are you licensed? You know, what is your insurance? What like how long is the lease that you sign? What's gonna happen if next year the owner will come to you and you say, okay, can cancel the lease? You didn't even cover your expenses for uh, furniture. What's gonna happen if you want to sell? Like there is so many points where you can lose money. So use someone who know, make even zero money, but look at it as like a learning experience. education, yeah. right? Like a yeah. learning curve, educational, like think about like if someone wants to do something, usually they're going to go and pay for a class or for a course or something. So instead of doing that, if you want to cut through everything, pay for at least someone that will help you d while you already have it. Like, you, you know, yeah. Learning the field would be like the most beneficial thing. Yeah. We always talk about like if you went to college and or high school and you learn in the classroom or a uh, real estate license, like you go in the classroom and you learn when you get out into the field, like things are different, like re learning from a book and learning the field yeah. are different. So why would you not get if, even if it takes away your cash flow? Let's say you have a property and all your cash flow goes to the property management company. You're still technically making money on appreciation, but you're learning the ropes of what it is right. to operate that in the field, yeah. which is probably your best learning situation you can give to somebody is learning as it's going. Uh, Look, and hopefully it, they make the right questions or ask the right questions and make the right moves. If you're looking into like most of the successful people in, in life, not just real estate, most of them have mentors. Yeah most of the successful people. So why someone who barely have like 20K in his bank account that is willing to risk it in a way because he thinks he's going to make easy money, doesn't, wants to do all that, risk all his money, but he's not really paying for a mentor, you know? I'm not saying I'll be a mentor. I'm saying like, pick whoever you want. <laughs> like, you know, but like pick someone, like yeah. ask for guidance, you know, and don't be shy about it. Yeah. And the cool thing with real estate, I have never reached out to somebody and asked for help. And they're like, no, thank you. Everybody that is in real estate is willing to have a conversation or give you a little bit they of want advice. want to show off or, their knowledge. <laughs> yeah. Or, or their, I mean, I guess, or their contact list, like call this person, he'll be able to help you right. with that. Right. They're always willing to help. It, yeah. 
it's a, a field that is very different because um, like I mentioned before, me and Dan worked together, working with that, that industry, uh, we were fundraising. You're not getting help from other people. Like they, they will go out of their way to take you down rather than help you. And to come from that and to go into real estate where everybody's like, yeah, here's contacts, here's lists. I can help you with that. Here's my phone number breath of fresh air, which is super cool. And that's why I tell people, if you want to get in, like get in, people will help you. You won't know it, but right. don't get stuck in analysis. But, but ask help. for help. That's, you know, yeah. because people, Absolutely. I don't know, when someone starts something and, and he has some experience, they they feel like, oh, if it's it's like a sign of weakness if you ask for help, but it's, it's not, you know. It, it's better to ask for help and even pay for help and not to lose money because... For people who start that only have like tens of thousands of dollars that they save, their setback is going to be so hard, you know, that it's going to take them a long time to try again. Yeah. And and that's, you know, I, I'm I'm happy to, you, you, you know, me right now, I'm really surrounding myself with the best of the best that I could get. You know, again, some people can get, maybe yeah. better people or stuff um but but and to know and to know your weakness is also important like i know uh, maybe not all my weaknesses but I, some of my weaknesses i'm aware of them so i'm like okay how can i still be successful in what i do with my weaknesses and how can i cover for them and that's not really a sign of weakness because every person has like down you know yeah. side that he's not great at you know you're yeah. talking about fundraising there are probably Peter uh, people uh, better than me in fundraising. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I'm going to pitch them the idea that they're going to want to be on board. They're going to make a lot of money from that deal and they will raise the money, you know? Yeah. So that's perfectly fine. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's what makes the team go round. I like that. The only way, if you want to grow, you know, it's the only way. You have to. Delegation, you have to. Yeah. You delegate to where you're uh, weakest or where your interests are not, and you put somebody in with stronger interests there. Um, it it does complete the the team. Yeah, I, I can tell you that uh, the partner I have in the brokerage, so his software, right? Boom! Now that I mentioned, he brings incredible people to his board to be a part of the board, and they get some percentage in the company. And those are people that like, if I start sharing names, it's it's like really high ranked in the industry with so much experience. It's unbelievable that they're here. So for him, he's like, you know, okay, I'll offer them something and they can take me to the next level. And without those people, he, he wouldn't be where he's at now. Yeah. And it's a hundred percent the way I see it. And again, everybody should profit, you know, I mean, we, we live one once like, yeah you make it make it comfortable for everybody <laughs> yep absolutely i like it that is a a very interesting story a very cool career that you're into um i know we went over our hour and i want to let you go on here on a friday here but yeah. um i want to see how this move into texas goes i'm i've always been fascinated with the texas real estate um I'm I'm excited to hear what happens with that one. So I, I can give you a quick example, just how I'm looking at it right now. So, you know, I, I've been to Texas, but I'm not like the most familiar with whole Texas. So I start looking online, like what are the best uh, locations for Airbnb? And then you see a lot of, you know, articles and stuff like that. And then from those articles, I put a list of like, let's say, 10 uh, different areas in Texas. Each area I go into and I'm starting to look in like, okay, how many Airbnb units they have? What is the average occupancy price? And then I'm looking whether they have even acre lot properties there in that area because it might be like more like, you know, like a, a family area that is like smaller lots or stuff like that. So like that's how from that I made it into like three areas that I find that are good. And then I'm looking like, okay, how much a property costs in this area, this area, that area that like, like that's like kind of like how I'm getting into the best locations. Then I'm finding like companies in that area that already manage 
properties, starting communication with them to see what they think about the numbers and everything. It, it's a it's a it's a process, you know, and then to know all the of course the regulations, which is super important. Uh, you know, you don't want to be canceled a, a month after you start. Um, so so I think everything realistically probably in like two months will have more like knowledge about like, okay, let's book a flight and start looking into properties. Uh, and then very quickly, I mean, because we have the funds to start. So it's like, we're, we're pretty much, I think, but, but to get to even the point today, why Texas? And that it takes like a year, you know? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I mean, that's a big plan for you guys, but it looks like you went through your due diligence. So it sounds like uh, maybe summer of 25, You'll have some action going on. In, yeah, in we'll Texas. do another podcast in summer of 25. <laughs> summer of 25. We'll at least have one down there. If if you're looking to buy within the next two, so you're hopefully isolating something by January, barring nothing goes weird with the economy. We always got to put that yeah. little asterisk in there. 25, beginning of 25 uh, makes sense. And by the way, we have to. Like I noticed that if a company, it doesn't matter what you do, if you don't think a step ahead, I mean, we could still buy properties in Florida. We're still buying properties in Florida. Yeah. We just closed on like four properties in the last month and a half. But it, it's it's like we always want to be pre, pre, prepared. What if this happened? Or what if that happened? Like where to go next? And if we're not going to always think like what's next, what's next, then we're not going to be a successful company. Like that's the way I see it. Yeah. Always looking for progress. Always, yeah. Or are yeah. you going to drown? <laughs> yeah. Not a lot of sharks out flood. there. Start the show with flood and you end the show with flood. <laughs> um, no, that's that's cool. Dan, hopefully we can get him back on middle of uh, 25 because I'm interested to see how this transition into, to uh, Texas goes. And selfishly, I like hearing more and more success stories of uh, getting outside of your bubble, outside of your state, investing long distance. Uh, I think the more successes I hear will nudge me in that direction to getting yeah. a little more comfortable with it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Look, but, at, at the end, um, you I know, I don't know if I'm going to Zanzibar yet, but we can at least get to like the other Midwest. You, you know, you know what I tell people like in, in Zanzibar, for example, you know, I said, let, let's say, people are open to invest in different countries and they're like, and I'm like, you know, okay, let's say it doesn't matter where you invest right now. Will you be happy with like 15% return annually? They will say, of course. I'm like, great. We're making 20 to 30% return. <laughs> now, every question they might say like, okay, but it's a third world country. What if, what if? there is an answer for everything, right? And, and then it becomes to a point that when you start showing numbers, so as as scared as you can be, there are legit numbers, you know? So so then the question is like, why is a person really scared to do the next step? And I think that's more important to, to really understand like why someone is, because it is scary. Like, but I'm saying like, to me, if I go to um, Europe, again, doesn't matter where in Europe, you know, Portugal, or Africa, to, oh, it's it's not where I live. When I get two hours from where I am, I'm like okay, does so why does it matter where? I'm not there; yeah. it's someone else. So that's like how I see it. And then if I'm scared, like okay, why am I scared? By the way, I just closed a, a, another a deal there. I'm, I'm not as involved, but I closed the investor in Serengeti. Serengeti is in Tanzania, and it's the second. Uh, safari in the world like size wise it's the second oh, really? uh, one in the world and we have a land in the safari that we can build a hotel it's going to be like a glamping hotel and you cannot find now lot in serengeti to build a a structure that is not moving with the season so so you could find areas that because the animals move seasonally so you have to move with them you cannot find more lots that you can build like to stay because it's a stationary yeah. is like a different construction. So we have one. Um, and again, people are, 
now this, now, you know. But the question is like, look at the numbers. Like you have four season in Serengeti, for example, a night per person over a thousand dollars a night. Wow. And you can build it, like you can build a structure there for for nothing, you know, like it's cheap. So so the question is like, why are you scared? You know? And I think once you realize I have no answer to it. if you have an answer, okay. But but yeah. once you keep re- replying to all the fears, then what's left? Like, okay, let's do it, you know? Yeah. So that's how I look at it. And I trust me, I'm not a gambler. I ask a lot of questions before I put my money in somewhere. But then when I really get an answer for everything, I'm like, okay, let's do it, you know? Yeah, no, definitely. I like the perspective of once it's over two hours, like it's long distance, even if it's in the state, like you're still not getting there. <laughs> I'm not there. I like the perspective. You're pushing me. You're giving me a little shove in the back yeah. to get there. Well, you guys should, can come to Florida, you know, <laughs> and see what we have. <laughs> We're going to do that in like the middle of the frozen tundra. Tampa, Clearwater here. area for sure. I like right, well, let, let, let me know when you're in Florida. We will. We will. Uh, well, thanks for giving us the time. We are going to link your website into the show notes. Um, yeah, I'll give you and, my uh, links too for my, um, yes, just like my social. Yes, get a hold of you or find out more information. Um let us know because we'll put that in the show notes for you so people can reach out. All right, guys. Pleasure. And uh, we'll be in touch for sure. Great we meeting will. Talk have with a you. Good, Had a lot yeah, of fun. Have a good weekend. Thank you, guys. You too. <laughs> Bye. Yeah.